master's thesis work. Um, Drew originally did his undergraduate work at uh, Suwannee, where he majored in psychology and developed an interest in animal behavior, which eventually led him to marine science, which eventually led him to physical oceanography. <laughs> um, so when I first met Drew, uh, he had already um, started work and started uh, defining his research question with, with Erica McPhee Shaw, and it was serendipitous that he just happened to be focusing in on a place that was near and dear to my heart, which is the uh, coast, uh, coastal ocean off of Vancouver Island, where I'd done a lot of my graduate work. Um, and in particular, he's taken advantage of an effort by the Canadians to uh, wire the ocean and make available vast amounts of data to whoever wants to work with it. And this is an effort that NSF has been following up on and, and building up upon uh, in, in different locations uh, in the US coastal waters. Um, so Drew has used this opportunity to create a unique study of the internal wave climate in a submarine canyon, which is kind of an environment that's notoriously difficult to um, make long-term studies in. And so for this reason and more, Drew was awarded the Zippius Martin Scholarship in 2017 for creativity in marine science and dedication for community service. In addition to his research and teaching uh, here at Moss Landing, he spent lots of time at the Smith Lab at Ambari applying a lot of the same techniques that he'll be talking about today to um, uh, navigation of deep sea autonomous vehicles and, and deep sea currents. Um, so many of you know Drew is a dedicated graduate assistant in courses like physical oceanography and data analysis. Some of you know him as a shipmate uh, on the point, sir. Um, but I'd like to welcome you all uh, to, um, to give Drew a round of applause as he, uh, as he, prevents, as he prevents his thesis. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> well, thanks for coming out on a Monday, everybody. I know this isn't the best time for theses, um, but I'm glad that you're all here, and I can't wait to tell you about the work that I've been doing um, with Tom over the past few years now, um, looking at the internal wave dynamics of Barkley Submarine Canyon. So, let me start my timer here. So I've got about an hour that I got my clicker. There we go. So I've got about an hour to run you through some of the more complex um, physical environments that we study in physical oceanography and talk to you about some of the some pretty complex uh, methodologies for analyzing data. So if you come away with an understanding of um, these sort of questions over here, I think I will have done my job today. Um, so let's jump right into it with the sort of easy one what are submarine canyons? Well, you might not think about it that often, but uh, the bottom of the ocean is not a flat environment. So it's um, periodically interrupted by this really rough scale topography. Um, and some of the biggest geological features on the planet happen to be the continental slope. So it's this part of the ocean where we transition from these sort of shallow coastal seas down to the abyssal depths. Um, and those slopes uh, border every single continent on the planet. So they're, they're these massive features, and often those continental slopes are incised uh, by submarine canyons. Um, and these canyons are really dynamic features. Um, and they can be uh, on scales of like the Grand Canyon. So they're these massive features. Um, and they're really interesting to study for that reason. And you might ask how these canyons come to be in the first place. Um, and they're actually, they're, the answer to that is twofold. So um, seismic activity can um, cause them, but one of the ways that they're really cut out is via these things called turbidity currents. And these things are a lot like avalanches that happen underwater, but they're extremely energetic. Um, I guess avalanches on land are too. Um, but instead of made out of snow, they're, uh, they consist of sediment and uh, large rocks and things like that. So these are incredibly powerful erosive forces um, that erode these gashes in the continental slope over time. And you might be familiar with um, one of the submarine canyons um, on our coastline. It just happens to be outside the window from you here. It also happens to be the largest in the lower 48. So this is a great place to do internal wave research, or excuse me, submarine canyon research. Um, but outside of that, these are, they're actually pretty prevalent features. So this is just a uh, 
a graph showing sort of the global distribution of where we find submarine canyons. And we happen to be located in one of the places where they exist in greater frequency than, than a lot of the others. Um, but you'll notice that there's some huge gaps in our, uh, our mapping of these places, and that's because that requires pretty fine scale bathymetric data to be able to see where these things are, and you have to be right over top of them to see them. Um, so we're still sort of finding submarine canyons as we go along. Um, and I mentioned that these are prevalent features, so they uh, represent about 20% of the shelf from the equator um, to Alaska on the uh, Pacific West Coast um, of the United States, and it's about 50% um, north of that. Um, but there, they also happen to be these really interesting places for physical oceanography, um, apart from just their geology. Um, so we know that they happen to be regions of enhanced upwelling. And we'll, I'll give you a little bit of a description about what upwelling is a little bit later on. Um, but there are also places where we know that there's increased mixing in the ocean. And that's a huge uh, topic for research in physical oceanography over the last 50 years. Um, and there's still some important questions that are tied to where mixing happens. Um, so that makes them important places to study. And finally, there are these important regions for cross-shelf exchange. So they're important for how water and things like sediment move from the coastal region where we see them all to the deep ocean where they can be removed from the, um, from the system. And in spite of being um, really prevalent features, they're actually really poorly understood. So the exception to that is Monterey Submarine Canyon. So we've got this great institution right out our back door called Mbari that has contributed a lot to our knowledge of submarine canyons. But globally, we know very little about these regions. And if you're not a physical oceanographer, you might ask, well, why do I care about it? Uh, submarine canyons? Um, but if they're, they're, it turns out they're really important for sediment transport, as I mentioned earlier. So the sand that you see on beaches isn't there all the time. So it's a moving system. Um, and one of the ways that sediments in the coastal zone can be removed is through these submarine canyons. Um, but if you've ever been to Monterey Bay Aquarium or been whale watching out in Monterey Bay or been diving, you know that this region is extremely biological, biologically productive. Um, and it turns out that some of that bioproductivity can, could be related to how flow interacts with submarine canyons. Um, and that, anecdotally at least, is the case in other submarine canyons around the world. So anywhere that you have, or there's some evidence to support that where you have submarine canyons, you also have increased biological activity. And finally, they appear to be um, hot spots for internal waves. Um, and that's what really drew my interest to them in the first place. So then, what are internal waves? Well, to talk about internal waves, I have to give you some sort of terminology so we have a sort of common language here. Um, and in terms of waves, I just want to give you some, um, some background on, on some of the words that I might be using later on. Um, so at the most basic level, some of the things that we measure when we talk about waves are their frequency, um, their wavelength, uh, their phase, and their amplitude. And so the wavelength is just the distance between repeating elements of a wave. So the distance between peaks or troughs in this case. Um, the amplitude is the height of the wave. The frequency is how many oscillations the wave takes in a unit time. And the phase is the position of the wave cycle at a given point. So just the, um, where you are along the propagation of the wave. Um, and that's sort of a difficult one to, to think about. But um, if you think about one cycle of the wave, that represents 360 degrees of phase. So that just tells you where on the wave you happen to be. And then a little bit later on down the road, you'll have to remember this one. But I'll start talking a little bit about um, some of the tidal constituents. Um, and all you need to take away from that is that the tide is actually this complex signal down here where you have movements happening on different periods. Um, and for us to tie that to some of the physical features of the tide, we have to be able to pull out distinct movements on this really complex signal. Um, so I will talk about the semi-diurnal um, part of the tide. And that's just the portion of the tide that happens twice a day. And the big one there is the M2. So you'll probably hear me say M2. What I mean is just the portion of the tide that's tied to the, the moon that we see twice a day. 
And then I'll probably also mention the diurnal constituent. And the big one there is the K1. And that's just the once a day tide that we see. And that's tied to the sun's um, gravitational effect. OK, so now that we've got a general wave understanding, um, the next thing we need to understand to talk about internal waves is density in the ocean. Um, so something that you might also not think about that often is that the ocean is not homogeneous, which means it's not the same from top to bottom. It's actually made up of a bunch of different density layers stacked on top of each other. And this is a great um, illustration of that. So this is a, um, a cruise line that was taken in the Pacific, and it's just showing um, the depth of the ocean and um, distances along the axis here. And in the, the sort of this side of the plot, you've got um, the south, and this is the north up here. And these lines of constant uh, density are called isopycnals. So I just want you to have this picture of the, the ocean that is um, one of many of these density layers stacked on top of each other. Um, and I should also mention that density in the ocean is set by temperature and salinity. And those properties um, change depending on where you are on the planet. Um, and this, this layering of density layers is called stratification. You hear me say that word a lot. It's just referring to um, how uh, layered the system is or how many um, of these different layers you have stacked on top of each other. And you've probably experienced this, this layering if you've ever swam in a pool that um, hasn't been mixed in a while, or you go to your grandma's pond and you dive down to the bottom. You'll be swimming in the top where it's nice and warm, and then you'll dive down and you'll find that cold layer in the bottom. What you found is just another layer of fluid that is denser than that surface layer and that has sunk to the bottom. And the same thing happens in the ocean. And the cool thing about that is anywhere that you have fluids with different densities laying on top of each other, you can propagate energy as waves. So if you think about it, the surface waves are a type of internal wave because the atmosphere is this fluid body too. But the difference between the air and water in terms of density is much stronger than layers of the ocean. So if you notice, just in this little plot here, um, you've got these sort of small scale waves that happen on the surface. And compare that to the amplitudes down here in the uh, layers that are much closer together in density. And you can see that amplitudes of internal waves can dwarf what we see on the surface. And I'll show you some cool visualizations of how that works a little bit later. Uh, the other thing about uh, it not being a just two-layer system is that internal waves are not um, restricted to traveling in one plane the way that surface waves are. So if you're a wave on the surface, you can only travel on the surface, right? You can't do anything in a different plane. Um, because of the way that the ocean is stratified, internal waves can actually travel at angles to the surface. They can bounce off layers of the ocean. They can reflect off the bottom of the ocean. Um, so they're really dynamic um, things to study, which makes it pretty challenging. Um, and their physics can get really complicated. And you probably have more interactions with internal waves than you might think. So if you've ever been to a beach shop and you've seen one of these, these are just internal waves in a bottle. So it's typically some um, type of oil which will float on water with food coloring in the bottom. And you can make really interesting um, amplitude waves happen inside these um, uh, little models. Um, but you can also actually see these things from space. So they're incredibly pervasive. They happen all the way through the ocean. Um, and they, they happen on such a scale that they're visible from um, really high altitudes. But, and, and they also happen in the atmosphere. So if you've ever seen anything like this when you've been driving um, down the coast, these are just internal waves that are happening inside the atmosphere. Um, so the atmosphere is stratified just like the ocean is. Um, but don't be confused by this. They're actually really hard to study. So most of the internal waves that happen happen in parts of the ocean where we are not. Um, and they're really challenging. And uh, you need particularly, uh, particular kinds of instruments to be able to see these features. And I mentioned that their physics are really complicated. Um, I promise this is the last equation that I'll throw at you. But it's just meant to indicate just how complicated these things actually are. And uh, if you're wondering why somebody would look at equations like that, it's because these features are really cool. Um, 
and they do really interesting things in the ocean. So this is just a great visualization of how these waves sort of cascade through the water column and how they interact with topography. And you'll see how they sort of like pulse around and they bring water that's down in the bottom back up to the surface. And um, you can see just by the way that these things move how much mixing can happen in these regions. Uh, so this is uh, from a data set that um, was collected in the Luzon Strait, which is one of the more interesting regions for internal wave research. It's in the South China Sea, um, and it's been uh, very well studied of late. Um, but it just also shows you how um, the scale at which these waves can propagate. So they can be created in the Luzon Strait there and then propagate all the way across the ocean, um, which adds just another level of complexity to how these wave fields uh, operate. And so you might ask yourself, where does all this energy come from? Um, and so it comes from a couple places. Um, you can cause internal waves at the surface. So if you've got a breeze blowing one way like we do in our diurnal uh, sea breezes, uh, that's just a scenario where you have the breeze blowing one, day, one way during the day, and then it'll flip around and blow the complete opposite direction at night. And that backward and forth, uh, back and forth movement of wind will actually move the water on the surface and that oscillation can cause internal waves to happen. Um, another way that you can get them is via flow over topography. Um, these are called lee waves and you've probably experienced this before if you've ever flown over the Rockies. That turbulence that you feel on the eastern side of the Rockies is actually internal waves breaking as the jet stream flows over the Rockies. Um, so that's the one that you've probably seen more often or experienced at any rate. But overwhelmingly, the majority of energy that goes into internal wave fields is put there through the tides. So the tide isn't just this sort of back and forth movement of water that we see in uh, the harbor. It's actually this process that happens on the entire water column. And when that pulsing moves over topography like we saw in that last video, um, you can cause internal waves and you can actually distribute a lot of that tidal energy that has been otherwise locked up in just sort of this pulsing of water up and down. And so this is another great visualization that comes from that Luzon Strait, um, those Luzon Strait studies. Um, and I just want to point out a few things before I start it. Um, first of all, I want you to watch the depth here. So this is depth on the um, y-axis, and we're just showing um, th this black sill here is that topog topographical feature that we saw in that uh, previous demonstration. And I want you to watch the, um, the isopycnals here too. So they look nice and straight before this process starts, um, but you'll see what happens when one of these waves comes by. And finally, pay attention to the, the time scale here. So this looks like it's happening really fast, but this is actually dramatically slowed down so we can see how these things work. I'll wait until the GIF restarts here. So this is the tide coming over this sill and watch the amplitude of the change in these isopycnals. So imagine a, a wave that's breaking almost a mile and a half from top to bottom twice every day. There's a ton of energy tied up in these things. Um, and as such, that makes them really interesting to study. So why are internal waves important to study in submarine canyons? Um, because all of the stuff that we saw so far hasn't been in submarine canyons. That's just over sort of a ridge in the ocean. Well, because Walter Monk said so, for one. <laughs> Walter Monk is sort of the Einstein of physical oceanography. Um, he's made tremendous contributions to our understanding how the physics in the ocean work. And he made some pretty key um, observations about energy distribution in the ocean. Um, and the big one came in a paper called Abyssal Recipes in 1966, in which he, not he noted that um, for this process of thermohaline circulation to operate, and thermohaline circulation is just this sort of global conveyor of um, water into the deep ocean and then back up to the surface. So we know that you can put water down into the bottom of the ocean in just two places on the planet, in the North Atlantic and down here in the Southern Ocean. And the way that that happens is you make really cold, really salty water when ice forms in these regions. Um, and that resultant really dense water sinks to the bottom of the ocean and then it stays down there. 
And we know that at some point it has to come back up to the surface because we're constantly putting uh, deep water down into these regions. And we also know that the ocean is stratified. So if it, uh, if it weren't stratified, then um, we wouldn't have to track the energy here. But because it is, we know that there's some sort of return flow, but there's a whole lot of energy that is required to make these really dense waters in the bottom come back up to the surface. Um, but the problem is, if you go out and measure um, potential energy anywhere in the ocean, you'd be off by about an order of magnitude to make that happen. So we're missing energy in the ocean. And that's been a huge topic of research for physical oceanography since this paper came out. And so uh, Walter Monk made these observations that um, <laughs> it was bound to happen. Um, to, uh, to account for this energy, we have to have regions of the ocean that are disproportionately accounting for mixing in this system. Um, and it turns out that submarine canyons might fit the bill to be these sort of regions. We know that there's extremely, ele or there's elevated mixing in these regions. Um, and they're distributed around the global ocean. Um, so that may help us explain how this process works. Um, and it also may help us explain why submarine canyons are so biologically productive. If they're these regions of elevated mixing, then they'd be bringing this sort of nutrient-rich, cold, deep water that's in the sort of bottom parts of the canyon back up to the surface. And so no matter what you're interested in uh, in the ocean, if you're in a submarine canyon region, there's some really interesting things to pull out here. And so how do we study internal waves? Um, well, normally what you have to do is go out with a big research vessel like this one and do what's called a CTD, which is just lowering an instrument through the water column that tells us information about the stratification of the water column. Um, and you might also use an instrument that will, um, is able to sense currents in the water so you can um, look at the way that the water column is moving. But this is a really expensive process, you might uh, know. Um, and Another problem with that is if you're doing shipboard internal wave research, you're limited in the amount of time that you're able to look at these features. Um, so you only get about a two week look at these things. Um, and that's something that I sort of was interested in addressing when I came up with this project. Um, and something else that I mentioned, uh, most, of the, most of what we understand about physics in submarine canyons um, was done in places like Monterey Submarine Canyon, which is this very unique shape and it's extremely big as I pointed out earlier. Um, so there's some reason to believe that um, what I wanted to do was look at a canyon that didn't have these sort of unique features about it. I wanted a more sort of stereotypical V shape to look at canyons in general. Um, and I was fortunate enough to find a site that um, allowed me to do just that. So uh, I was never able to find who Barkley Submarine Canyon was named after. So I'm just going to assume that it's Hall of Fame basketball player Charles Barkley um, because he's the only Barkley that I know. Uh, so if, in case you don't recognize where we are in the, the world, um, this is off of Vancouver Island out here and this is Puget Sound. Seattle's over here. Um, and it shows you just how many canyons there are along this shelf. But this right here is Barkley Submarine Canyon. And this is what it looks closer up. You see this really nice um, V shape. Um, and having a cool name wasn't the only reason that drew me to this, uh, this particular region. Um, the main thing that drew me here was uh, what's called Ocean Networks Canada. And Tom talked a little bit about it earlier. But basically what it is is a national um, initiative of Canada to uh, wire the bottom of the ocean um, and put instruments out in really hard to study places um, to learn more about the deep ocean. Um, and one of those places just happens to be Barclay Submarine Canyon, which is right here. Um, but so this, this line that you see out here is what's called a moored cabled array. Um, and what that means is that all of these instruments that you see way out here in the deep ocean are connected to shore via a cable that's um, placed on the bottom of the ocean. And that sends power out to the instruments. But what it also does is it transmits the data that all of these instruments collect. And so uh, 
Ocean Networks Canada graciously puts all this data up on their website. So you can go and download data, um, in some cases going back to 2007, and all of these instruments are sampling 24-7. Um, so it's this tremendous data set, um, and it's a really cool place to be able to look at internal waves. And this is what the uh, uh, emplacement at Barclay Submarine Canyon looks like. So there are a couple of sites in and around the canyon. Um, and there just happen to be um, three in this upper section here. There's actually a fourth one now since this, plot, uh, since this graphic came out um, that have instruments that look at velocity. And uh, so it just happens to be this really cool place to study internal waves, even though it wasn't designed for that purpose. And I mentioned that uh, Ocean Networks Canada puts all this data up online. And if it seems like I'm standing up here being a spokesman for Ocean Networks Canada, I absolutely am. Uh, this data is amazing. And there's no way that a graduate student like myself would have been able to ask questions like this if it weren't for this data set. Um, so I'm incredibly grateful to be able to use this. Um, and I hope this talk gives you a sense of the kind of questions that you can ask of these data sets. And so before I get into um, talking to you about what I found, I want to sort of frame my research questions for you. And to start off with, um, the biggest question I had was, is there seasonality to these internal wave fields? Because most of the studies that we have, like I mentioned, are on these sort of two-week time scales. And that doesn't allow you to look at some of the big um, variability that happens in the ocean. So this, the nature of this data set allowed me to ask this question. And I think it's a really unique one for internal wave research. And so we know that the region that Barkley Canyon is in undergoes these seasonal shifts. And so the big one in this region is the movement of this Davidson current. So in the winter, you have this really strong um, counterclockwise current up here. Uh, and then in the spring, this starts to sort of slow down until it finally shuts off and moves offshore. And that's replaced in the summer by this um, strong southward extension of the California current. And that's reflected in the wind uh, data that I'm showing up here. So this is just showing that you have um, prevailing winds in a sort of northwesterly direction. And then over the course of the summer, that shifts and is, um, switches to a southeasterly um, wind direction. And the currents do the same thing. And this just happens to be upwelling favoring in this region. And so the next question that I wanted to ask of this data was, is there spatial variability in the internal wave field? So we know that where you are in, the, in a submarine canyon can influence the amount of energy or even the parts of the internal wave um, trains that you're seeing. And um, this is just showing sort of how that works. So this is a diagram showing um, internal wave beams. And try and remember that internal waves don't propagate the way that surface waves do in this one plane. They can actually um, be confined three-dimensionally. So they sort of operate like beams. And because of that, they can bounce off parts of the ocean, and they can sort of reflect off of um, the topography in the bottom of the ocean. So that means that where you are in the canyon would determine um, the amount of energy that you're actually seeing. And remember that the instruments that I have are located throughout the canyon. And uh, I should mention that the degree of stratification of the water column um, actually changes the way that these beams travel. Um, and so you kind of have three different scenarios that you can have happen. Um, the first is what's called um, supercritical, in which uh, the angle relative to the, the angle of the propagating internal waves relative to the slope is steep. And when that happens, you get this sort of cascading of energy towards the shore. Um, the opposite scenario is one in which that angle is shallow relative to the slope. Uh, that's called subcritical. And when that happens, you get this reflection of energy um, away from shore or offshore. And then the third scenario is what's called the critical scenario. And um, that's when the angle of propagating internal wave energy is the same as the slope that they're interacting with. And when that happens, you'll actually, the energy that's in that internal wave chain will get distributed right on the shelf. And that's a scenario where you have much more elevated mixing and a lot more um, uh, cascading of energy down these um, scales. 
And this is just a, a, a plot that was made in Monterey Submarine Canyon. It's sort of a cross section of the canyon, and it's showing you how those energy spectra um, vary depending on where you are in the canyon. And the final question I wanted to ask was, uh, how does the vertical structure vary? Um, so because we know that these internal waves travel as beams like this, um, modeling studies have shown that canyons can be really efficient at trapping internal wave energy. Um, so as these beams sort of move in and around the rims, um, you can see them reflect down into a canyon. So this is just sort of a, a 2D simulation of what these thing, how these things might operate. And in this scenario, you see these beams come down and sort of reflect off the wall until they reach the bottom and then they're trapped. And when that happens, you get this really um, bottom intensified um, energy spectra. And this uh, graph over here is just showing sort of the different angles that these things can take um, as they propagate down through a canyon. And so tracking the, the phase propagation of these um, wave trains can tell us a lot about um, how the energy is propagating. And because I don't have stratification data for these regions, this tells us a lot about how these waves propagate that I couldn't otherwise ascertain. And so I wanted to show you one more time where the data comes from. So this is just another view inside um, Barclay Submarine Canyon. And I'm using three different sites in that region. And I apologize for the numbering. The pods were actually numbered in the order that they were put out. So it looks like it's counterintuitive. But I just want you to remember that the canyon axis is right in the middle of the canyon, right here on the Thalweg. Um, the canyon slope is right here on the, the, um, the steep part of the canyon. And then the canyon rim is at the top of the canyon up here. And they're all at different dent, uh, depths as a result of that. And so the instrument that I'm using to look at velocity signals in the water column is called an ADCP. It's an acoustic Doppler current profiler. And what it does is they're deployed on the bottom of the ocean and they emit a sound at a known frequency. And then they utilize the Doppler shift, which is just that changing of pitch that you hear um, uh, when things are moving. So have you ever been on the road and you've heard a car going by you honking its horn and it does that pitch shift? What you're doing is just changing the distance between your ear and the sound. Um, so the same principle can be used, utilized to triangulate um, the way that water is moving through the water column. And you don't just get the direction that the water is moving right at the instrument. Because of the way sound uh, travels in the ocean, you can actually um, get data up through the water column. Um, so this is just showing what that would look like. Um, and the way that the instrument collects this data is it breaks it down into two different axes. So it records the easterly component of the velocity and the northerly component of the velocity. And you see that, uh, sorry, that didn't come out well. Basically what this is showing is that a red is a positive um, flow in that axis and blue is a negative flow in that axis. So a red flow up here means it's traveling easterly and a blue flow down here means it's traveling southerly. But you can actually see what internal waves look like. So these, this pulsating behavior that you see right here and um, um, water that's traveling right next to each other in two different ways, uh, two different um, layers is how these waves actually propagate. And this is just another view of where those uh, instrument platforms are. And so um, just to orient you a little bit with what I did to the data once I collected it, um, so I downloaded the data in one minute period, so I get a, a measurement every minute. Um, and secondly, I rotated the data, so the, the data comes off the instrument in this true east-north um, orientation, but that doesn't really make sense in a region like this where north is this way and east is this way. Um, because of the orientation of the, uh, the bathymetry here, uh, it makes more sense to rotate it so you get this nice up canyon and across canyon orientation. That allows you to capture a lot more of the motion that's happening. And finally, um, the periods that I'm looking at, so I collected data from uh, September of 2013 to January of 2015, but because of the um, 
the seasonal questions that I was interested. I'm only presenting the March, April, spring season and June, July, summer season in this um, talk. All right, let's get into it. So this is uh, showing the Canyon Slope uh, site in the spring. And we're just showing that cross canyon axis. So the axis that is along the coastline this way um, and is sort of across the canyon. And just to orient you a little bit, we're showing time on the bottom here. Um, so this is that whole two month period. And this is depth um, below the surface on this axis. So you see these really strong periodic fluctuations that happen. And because we're looking at the seasonal differences here, I want to show you how those change. Um, so this is the same site in the same orientation just um, two months later in June, July. Um, and you can see just how dramatically different these two things look. Um, so you have this really strong um, northward flow up here in the, the surface, or about 650 meters up in the water column. Um, that just completely disappears in the summer. Um, and you also have this really nice periodic fluctuation that has to do to, with the tide. And we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in just a couple of slides here. And so just to remind you where we're looking, so this across canyon axis is this direction and the up canyon axis is this direction. And so this is that upslope or up canyon um, axis uh, comparing the same two periods at the same location. Um, and one of the really th interesting things you see is that in this June, July period, um, you have this strong shift in around 650 meters. Um, and that looks really classically like um, some canyon driven upwelling. And basically what that is, is just um, when you have this really strong um, poleward flow along the coastline where you have a canyon like Barkley Submarine Canyon, these currents that are in sort of the mid reaches of the system are forced into the canyon. And because they have nowhere else to go, they're sort of um, forced to come up onto the shelf here. And when they do that, they bring that sort of cold water that's down here up with them. Um, so this shows you just how uh, the physical feature of this canyon can influence flow in the region. And this has nothing to do with internal waves, by the way. This is just sort of um, driven by the, the longshore currents. Sorry. And so if we're interested in looking at um, some of the, the periods of variability within these kinds of signals, you can't make a whole lot of sense out of this with just your eyes. So we need some way of looking at particular um, physical forcings that we sort of know are associated with this signal. And so to do that, um, we need to utilize what are called spectral analyses. And that's just a way of breaking down what is a complex signal like this one up here into its constituent parts. Um, and to do that, um, it, it'll be a, maybe a little challenging to think about at first. But what you're doing is you're breaking it down into the frequency of the motions that we're seeing. So I'll show you some plots that look like this. Um, and basically what we're doing is uh, the short period fluctuations, so the things that happen on a quicker time scale, are going to be on this side of the plot. And the things that happen on longer time scales are going to be on this side of the plot. And you'll see the, the peaks that are in this signal are showing you the energy that's happening at that particular frequency. Um, and it's a way for us to pull out which of these frequencies are important to the variability of, of this region. And I'll also show um, some 95% confidence intervals. That's just a way of. Um, describing which of the, the differences that we see in these peaks are significant. Um, but instead of plotting it as a line like this below and uh, above the signal that we're interested in, I'll just put a um, confidence interval up here so you can see what that distance would be without having that line sort of clouding the, the signal that I'm plotting. Um, and the way that I'm doing this uh, is just using a, a utilizing what's called a fast Fourier transform. And it's just a way to do this that is computationally um, a lot easier to do um, because you can go down some rabbit holes with um, um, computing some of the, the variability in these signals. And so this is showing um, those same um, 
plots that I showed earlier uh, and just breaking these two, those two um, what we call P color plots down into just a signal showing what the energy is at the uh, right above the instrument um, in the spring and the summer. So what you see is that at this two per day signal um, that I'm pointing out right here, that's the semi diurnal that M2 frequency that I mentioned earlier. Um, these are um, that twice a day tide that we see. So you see really nice strong peaks here, which is what we would expect. Um, but the cool thing about this is you see a little bit more energy in that spring season at this time scale um, than you do in the summer. And the opposite is true out here at the semi diurnal. Um, and so this once a day is that, that uh, excuse me, diurnal um, signal that we're looking at. And for the purposes of internal waves, this is, can be a little problematic. And I won't go into why that is. Um, but basically, if you see a lot of energy out here, it can be tied to um, internal waves that are coming from a, across the ocean or from a different place, basically. So it's, it wouldn't be tied necessarily to um, the local tidal frequencies. So this is um, what this plot might suggest is that the summer might be more important in this region. Uh, remotely generated internal waves might be more important to the signals in these regions in the summer than in the spring, although that's not the entire picture. And so to look at that second question that I had um, concerning the site differences, I hope you can make out this green signal right here. Um, but basically what you see is at that semi-diurnal frequency, there is a dramatic, uh, a significantly larger energy signal at the canyon rim than inside the canyon. Um, and if you think about that in terms of this beam uh, of internal wave energy that I showed you earlier, uh, so you've got this beam that's sort of pulsing back and forth over the rim. And if you're an instrument that's right here, you're seeing all of that beam as it comes right by you. Whereas if you are, if the instrument is down here, you would be missing um, that, that internal wave energy as it comes through this sort of restricted beam propagation. Um, and you also see some um, elevated energy up here at the rim at some of these higher frequencies. Um, and again, that, that shows us that it, this beam interpretation is likely what's happening. Um, and at the tidal frequencies, um, we see that the, the two canyon sites, I'll probably refer to them uh, going forth, um, that's just, I just mean the axis and the slope, so the two sites that are inside the canyon versus the rim, which uh, is outside of the canyon. So when I say the canyon sites, that's what I mean. Um, the exception is out here at that K1, um, and what that might be saying is that the axis is seeing a lot more remotely generated internal wave energy than um, the slope is. Um, but we don't know enough about the, all of the physics that are happening here to be able to say one way or the other. And so this is a way of looking at um, how things vary as a function of frequency. And if we wanted to break this down and look at how these signals vary over time, um, one way to do that is called wavelets analysis. And so I'll just flash this up here to give you a brief idea of how that works. So basically what we're doing is making one of these plots um, for every time step that we use. Um, and to visualize that, they, you can get really complicated with these. But the, the main signal that we're interested in is that semi-diurnal peak, which I apologize is in periods here, not frequency. So one half is the same as twice per day. So that uh, semi-diurnal signal is right here. So what I've done is I've just taken um, that frequency at each of the locations and plotted it as a line so you can see how it varies with time. And the, the one thing that is um, common between all of these sites is that the M2 power is quite variable over time. And one of the things that's really interesting about this is that it seems to be out of phase between the rim and the canyon. So when you have um, more power in the canyon, you tend to have less power on the rim. And that phase shift is really um, interesting to track, and we'll talk a little bit about it um, in some of the later analyses. <laughs>
And so um, to talk about that phase, uh, I just wanted to show you how that sort of propagates uh, inside the canyon. Um, so this is just showing the phase and the amplitude of the harmonics, and that's just the, um, the motions that are happening on the known local tidal scales. Um, and so the thing that you notice is that the amplitude of the waves are really variable um, throughout the water column. You see this nice peak right around 800 meters. Um, but the more interesting part of this is that the phase propagation is upwards. So that just means um, the phase is increasing uh, as you move up in the water column. And the way that internal waves propagate, um, when you have upward phase propagation, the propagation of the energy is actually in the opposite direction. So when you see nice strong uh, upward phase propagation signals like this, that means that the energy is propagating downwards. So I know that's a little challenging to think about, but just remember upward phase equals downward propagation of energy. Um, but the other thing that I need to mention when I uh, show you these harmonic analyses is that the harmonics in this region account for a surprisingly small amount of the vari variability. So remember that we're located really deep in the ocean. So these are all, all of these uh, sites, including this canyon slope data, are below 500 meters. Um, so this site is actually at around 900 meters. So that's way below where the wind would have any effect. So we expect that most of the movements that would be happening down here will be caused by the tide, but that's not what, what this analysis is showing. And one of the possible explanations for that, and in fact, the likely possible explanation for that, is that we're having internal waves come from other regions. So they're being created in other regions, and as they propagate across the ocean, um, they're removed from that local tidal um, cycles. Um, and so it seems like uh, remotely generated internal waves are really important to these regions. And so I'm, in this past plot, I'm showing you how um, that M2 power varies with time. Um, but to look at the vertical structure, I wanted to see how it varies with depth. So this is just going through and removing that the M2 frequency and its associated power at each bin of the ADCP. Um, so we get this nice spectral analysis all the way through the water column. And what you see is you have this nice um, peak at both of these instruments. So at the bottom of the rim data set, you see this elevation of energy. And sorry, I should point out that energy is increasing on this x-axis uh, to the right here, and it's decreasing to the left. And so at the bottom of the water column, you see this nice peak in the, uh, um, the rim data set. And you also see a increase in the uh, axis data set that's seeing that same depth. Um, so one of the things that we see right off the bat is that each of these sites have a pretty strong bottom intensification. Um, so the closer you get to the, where the instrument is or where the, the bottom of the ocean is at these sites, the stronger the energy signal is. Um, but the cool thing about this peak right here is that it's at the top of the, uh, where this ADCP sees, and you still see this same um, elevation of energy. And then down here on the slope, you also see this nice uh, bottom intensification that's happening. And all of this is visible at the semi-diurnal, uh, the diurnal frequency as well, but I'm just showing you the semi-diurnal frequency right here. And so breaking this down a little bit, um, I just want to go back and sort of summarize the points that came out of each of these analyses. Um, so we know that there uh, is a seasonality to the surface ocean, but it also seems that there's a pretty strong degree of um, seasonality to the internal wave field. Um, and this is in line with that seasonal upwelling um, that we know happens on the surface. Uh, and these processes can affect the stratification that we see in the water column. Um, and that can, in turn, affect how internal waves propagate in and out of this region. And in terms of site difference, um, we definitely saw that there was an apparent uh, canyon effect to the, the data sets. Um, if you remember, the canyon sites looked very similar to each other, and then the rim had this really distinct signal in all of the types of the analysis that I did. Um, 
And finally, we see much more. Um, I thought I put something else in there. So we saw much more energy at the rim than we did inside the canyon. And remember that beam um, propagation that we had. Um, that that could explain why we see this um, much more elevated energy up here on the rim than down in the canyon. And finally, uh, the vertical structure we saw that you have uh, bottom intensification. Um, it was particularly pronounced down here in the bottom of the canyon, but we saw it at all of the sites. Um, and this is likely um, attributed to that downward propagation of energy that we saw in the harmonics analysis. Um, and this supports some of the modeling studies that have been done on submarine canyons. Um, so it looks like this is the case in a, re in a real world scenario. Uh, it's kilojoules per meter, so it's just a measure of the energy uh, and how that energy is being distributed. Sorry, thank you for asking that question. And so to just wrap all this up, um, this, I hope, hopefully this study contributes to our understanding of how internal waves interact with submarine canyons. Um, and I want to impress, uh, hopefully you've come away with this concept that better understanding these features um, improves our complement comprehension of how some of the big scale processes in the ocean work. And doing so will allow us to make better long-term models of ocean circulation, for example. Um, it'll help us better parameterize uh, carbon cycle in the deep ocean, as well as better predict future climate scenarios if we understand how things are being mixed up and down in the global ocean better. And to finish off, I want to leave you with Charles Barkley playing basketball against Godzilla inside of a canyon. <laughs> and before I take your questions, I just want to say a couple of quick thank yous. Um, first and foremost, I have to thank Tom. Um, he has been integral to my uh, finishing this research. Uh, I came up with this idea with Erica, um, but I would never have executed it as well as I have um, if he hadn't been here to help me out with um, learning all this, and he's greatly improved my understanding of physical oceanography. And I want to thank uh, Erica, who was my advisor when I first came here. Um, she gave me my love of physical oceanography and um, is responsible for me being here today. And I also want to thank Kenneth Cole, who sort of stepped in after Erica took a job elsewhere and sort of mentored me for the year that I was on my own and made sure I didn't get lost. Um, and I also have to take a, a second to thank the Gashler and Martin families who have provided funding for Moss Landing uh, student scholarships of which I was a beneficiary. And finally, I have to thank Cassie, who uh, I would not have been able to do any of this stuff without. Thanks. being forced into the canyon and sort of up on the shelf. And part of that has to do with just the shape of the canyon because it's that more classical V shape mm -hmm. instead of that like, sort of bendy, wide thing that happens on the side of the canyon. Yes, correct. Uh, you would wonder who had, this was named after, it's actually named after Barclay Sound. And in, the 19th, in 1787, Captain Charles William Barclay, the Imperial Eagle, explored, explored the sound Named it after himself. <laughs> 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 
is basically that when you say energy, is the unit the velocity? Is, is that it's, a, it's a measure of the how the velocity is there. So um, I'm not sure that I can relate to the spectrum to the but, uh, spectrum directly to the energy. What it's measuring is how variability happens uh, at those different frequencies. So it's, it's made from a velocity signal. Well, I, I saw the, the, the dimension meter squared per second squared frequently, and maybe that comes out of doing that spectral so, analysis. Yeah, what it does is you're squaring, you're squaring um, the, the signal. So it's made from the velocity signal, and you're squaring it to get those things. So, so the, the, the part that I've had, maybe you could explain it. You, you mentioned when the angle of whatever is going on is just right. The maximum energy is now, and you said it was on the rim of the canyon. Yes. Does that does that mean basically? I mean, it, I, I don't know how to look at it the right way or even the wrong way. Does that mean that there is a collision you, between the land or the you know the the continent and the water that's harder at sometimes because the angle is just right? And is it something that would lead to? Um, causing turbidity currents? Or, uh, so, or yeah. sediments up and off? Is that, is, is that what my brain should be thinking? It is, yes. Yeah. And we've, we've seen this happen in different canyons around the globe. Um, so, you'll see these floors come by. And um, I think Erica did some work in the office of the time where she showed that these floors are really associated with this being the same from the middle of the canyon. So they can they can cause sudden uh, speed to come up and um, the slopes. And in fact, this plot actually comes from a paper. Um, I always mispronounce his name. It's I think Cashion. I always say Cashion. Um, but anyway, what that Cashion. What that paper suggests is that the reason that the continental slope has the shape that it does, or is at the angle that it is is because internal waves are keeping it there. So theoretically, you can have much thicker pile sediments or much steeper pile sediments on the continental slope than we actually see. And the reason for that, the reason that it's not that steep is probably because internal waves are coming by and moving it by these processes. If that answers your question. Just one more, just to straighten me out. Because, uh, you know, if you, you if you showed me the right um, picture, uh, it looks to me like it's a mess. It, uh, it, when you get an extreme and you showed the, the video of the isopycnals going all over the place, you can, if I didn't want to be quantitative, which I don't want to be, uh, I, I would have said, well, it looks like the whole thing you were looking at, either that was a strait or a canyon, turned over, it, like it mixed entirely. But th th is that really true? Uh, in that particular case, yes, it can be. Um, but this is this is a really dramatic scenario. So um, this has been a focus of a lot of internal research because of the shape of the canyon and the strength of the ties that it happens. You see, right there, it looks like it's now just completely discombobulated and miraculously it goes back to the normal place, which means it's stratified. Yes. And remember that this is a sort of backwards and uh, back and forth pulsing that happens every day. So as this, uh, what, what I'm showing here is the velocity of the colors. Um, so you're not, you can't really track the, the depths, the, the layers as they get sort of pushed around. Um, but you definitely have a dramatic amount of this situation. And I still don't get it. <laughs> 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 we're going to really challenge our teachers to be over Or should I assume that now that you have that big blob there, Will it ever go, when it goes back to stratification, does it mean that the big blob was transported or affected somewhere else at that point? It's somebody else's problem? Um, I think it can be. Um, but it, you have to remember that this, these are some of the more dynamic internal ties that we know of. So it's not like this everywhere that the internal tide interacts with the shelf. Um, so this is a, a special case. Anyway, it's, 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 it's very complicated.
It's, it's designed to show you just how dramatic this can be. But this is not the case everywhere all the time. Uh, Drew, can you go to the figure that has the M2 uh, from the three different locations at depth? And you talked about those little energy upticks sort of at the bottom. Uh, so I guess my question is, are, are those caused by, um, there we go, uh, are those caused by friction in the, the bottom, uh, like a terminal layer forming as these things sort of push against the bottom? Uh, they could be. In uh, this case, where you see this, this much higher um, energy signal, this is probably due to that um, tidal beam sort of running over the rim, and it may lead to friction. Um, but because of the type of instruments that I have, I don't using that. Um, so it, it's possible, yeah. And in fact, it's probably pretty good. Is the surface temperature of Monterey Bay, is it warmer in the winter or warmer in the summer? Just uh, the surface temperature. For it depends on when you're looking. But it can, and when you get these really nice uh, Strong upwelling events that happen, it can be colder in the summer. In the summer. Okay. And I'll, I'll talk to you about that over the winter. So, um, now that you've, you've done this study and you've looked at all the cable array data, can you go back and do one new study, like go out on a boat, or buy the Canadian, it's a really cool instrument? Uh, what, what would you do to? The thing that I'd love to do would be to go out and actually collect um, CGD data in these regions while I'm, um, and analyze it in concordance with this data. Um, because what that would allow me to do would be to look at the, the total energy propagation so I can see um, where the potential energy is, is changing. Um, and that'd be a really cool question to be able to do that. But that's something you can't look out physically do. Plus, I don't <laughs> Do you have any idea what the operating cost is of the, this? No, I never looked at it. Um, not cheap. Yeah. <laughs> so, and a huge portion of our IUs now is devoted to these type of ways, which is one of the reasons I don't know what's going on. So, there's a lot of cool data. Thank you.